Normally, at this time on a Sunday morning, Dumbling Cathedral would be a busy place, with people of all ages and from many parts of the world gathering to worship God. The choir would be in their usual places in the choir stalls and the cathedral kids in the front pews. People would be greeting old friends or visitors that they'd met for the first time. And today, Mothering Sunday, parents were due to have brought their child for baptism. But things are very different, and in a way we hadn't quite expected even last Sunday. The doors are shut, and within these ancient walls only two ministers and a director of music are here to lead worship, along with a willing volunteer to record things for us. But it is important that we do so. This has been a place of prayer and worship for many centuries, a sacred space to which people have come in joy or in sorrow, in pain or bewilderment, with faith or with their doubts. They have gathered in times of peace and times of conflict. And now, at a time when many are anxious and rather afraid, feeling their vulnerability perhaps as never before, and frustrated at being cooked up within the four walls of their homes, how can we remain silent? It is our faith that God is neither silent nor remote in times such as these. It would be wrong if the church had nothing to say. It would be the worst possible time for the voice of prayer to fall silent. And now, perhaps above most other times, as we wonder what there may be from God that can help us to hang on there and to maintain our faith. At a time when the things that normally give community life its shape are largely suspended, many of us are looking for ways to maintain community, to care for others, to affirm that we are not alone in all of this. And this act of worship, different though it is, is part of our desire to keep community together and alive. Today people have been asked not to come. That feels very strange to Dorothy and me as the ministers, and surely to the many others who normally strive to keep the doors of this cathedral building open as a place of welcome and sanctuary for all. The doors are closed, but closed for something of the same reason that they are normally open, as an expression of our care and our concern for people. They are closed because the best scientific advice is that it is not wise at present for people to gather in significant numbers. These are times without precedent in the lifetime of any of us. But we have advantages not enjoyed by our forebears. We have information technology. It will prove to be vital right now, for it is a way in which people, wherever they can, can still participate in worship, share in prayer, and hear the word of God being read and explored. Perhaps it takes a crisis such as this for the church to embrace more fully and imaginatively the power and the potential of technology. There will always be great worth in people gathering together. Perhaps we now recognise that with even greater force. But there are also other ways of communication that we can embrace, not as a substitute for gathering, but to enhance what we can do. We welcome you as we would normally love to welcome you in person to Dumbling Cathedral. We are glad that you are joining us for this rather different way of worshipping and hope that, engage, that engaging with us, you will feel that you are still part of a church community. Throughout the ages, God's people have not always had it easy, and there have been many tribulations in the past, each challenging, each testing endurance and faith. But if people have not found the answers they wanted to find, they have been able to discover anew that in God there is an enduring love, and because of that have found themselves discovering a surprising strength that they have then come to believe has originated from beyond themselves, and indeed from God himself. The psalmist wrote, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, 
though the mountains tremble with its tumult. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city, it shall not be moved. God will help it when the, help it when the morning dawns. The nations are in uproar, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge. Many of us have sung that psalm in the past. God is our refuge and our strength. And here is the music now. thirteenth psalm we read from the rising of the sun to its setting the name of the Lord is to be praised whether you are listening in growing daylight or lengthening shadow in morning or evening as the sun sets or rises let us praise the name of the Lord and join together in prayer let us pray God of all our yesterdays and tomorrows of this day and every day, our shelter against the storms of life, our guide in the confusion of life, and our constant companion in the days of darkness and of light, we pause in this moment to still ourselves, to seek calm amid the maelstrom of muddled thoughts, that we may be aware of your presence. God of creation, of majestic mountain and fragile flower, of roaring lion and bleating lamb, of surging wave and rhythmic heartbeat. In the unsteadiness of these days, help us to focus on your faithfulness. In all that is unfamiliar in these changing days, help us to remember your skill and expertise. In the depths of despair, let us remember your promises that the light ever shines in the darkness and that nothing can separate us from your love. In the purple-tipped crocus and jaunty daffodil, in the fervent nesting and busy singing of birds, in the burgeoning bud and lengthening days, as winter's chill recedes, and spring's warmth brings new life. Let us see and hear and know and appreciate the unfailing pattern of the cycle of life made manifest in nature's complexity and made real for us through Christ's life, death and resurrection. God of this time and all time, we give you praise and we offer you our worship. We know that our faith is not like armour, hard, unyielding, an impenetrable barrier against the slings and arrows of life, nor like a blanket in which we wrap ourselves, hiding away from the world, but a call to action, inviting us to follow in Christ's footsteps, to face the difficulties and hardships around us, to counter prejudice, injustice, exclusion, as in his name we show and share your love, your compassion, your concern, your empathy for the world and its people. Gracious and loving God, we admit that our practice often fails to follow that theory. Our actions belie what we profess. We have a tendency to be selfish and self-centred, 
caring more for ourselves than for others. We are neglectful of those in greatest need and by our choices and actions create divisions where we should be building bridges, cause tensions where we should be seeking to be peacemakers, bring disharmony where we should be striving for unity. And so we seek your forgiveness, your goodness and your mercy. God, our shepherd, lead us to quiet pastures where we may be nourished. God, our Father, bring us to the still waters where we may be refreshed. God, who mothers us, lead us and show us the right way to live. In Jesus' name we pray. As in his words, we join our voices with those around the world to say, Our Father, Father which, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom come. come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Hear the word of God as we find it in the scriptures of the Old Testament, reading Psalm 23. A Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Amen. Thanks be to God. Just as there is comfort food, so there are comfort psalms. Words that are familiar to many of us, Words to which we have turned at some of the toughest points of our experience. The 23rd Psalm, which happens to be the very psalm to which countless Christians all over the world will be turning on this fourth Sunday of Lent, is such a comfort psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The image of a shepherd was a familiar one to the people who first read and sang those psalms. The landscape that provided the backdrop for much of our Bible was that of a dry land, a land which to Scottish eyes, where rain is not usually in short supply, is a rather arid place. There was grazing, upon which a sheep could survive, but it was not lush and thick as in many of our fields and hillsides, and the shepherd would have to spend his days leading his flock of sheep from place to place, in order that he might find sufficient food for them to eat. And nights would be spent out in the open, protecting the flock from thieves or predators. You can still see such shepherds among the rolling, often dry hills of what we call the Holy Land today, doing what their predecessors have done for countless centuries. Shepherds were not always highly regarded or valued particularly at the time of Jesus' birth. They had to work out among their animals, out in the wild, seven days and nights of the week. And because of the demands of their work, couldn't observe the many rituals expected of a good Jew, including the washing and personal cleanliness that was very much part of the ritual of the faith. Which is perhaps my cue for the public health announcement on the importance of washing hands. 20 seconds, remember? Perhaps the time it takes to sing verse 1 
of Psalm 23. Yet for all of that, the image of a shepherd was a very powerful one in the Hebrew Bible. It was a shepherd lad called David, who although he was the youngest of his brothers, was chosen to be king over Israel. And it is to this particular shepherd king that tradition has attributed this psalm, The Lord is my shepherd. It is entitled, A Psalm of David. Even if scholars now maintain this attribution of the psalm to David, the shepherd king has come much later, and no one in fact knows who wrote the psalm, it is attractive to imagine somebody such as David, who had once worked as a shepherd himself, then reflecting on God as the great shepherd. Someone who knows just how committed a good shepherd has to be, leading those entrusted to his care to where they find what they truly need. It takes them to water still enough for them to stoop and to drink, who accompanies them through the dark places where death seems threatening, beating the rocks on the way with his crook or shepherd's staff so that sheep can hear and follow through the darkness. I mentioned that just as there is comfort food, so there also are comfort psalms. But comfort food isn't necessarily junk food, nor is this a lightweight psalm that makes hollow promises of an easy life. The psalmist, be it David the former shepherd or not, knows that life is not always a bed of roses. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Our faith is not rooted in a fantasy world where all is calm, all is bright. The psalmist alludes to the fact of our human limitations and weariness, and here he faces up to tough reality. We do inhabit a world of threat, including a hitherto unexpected virus that even the best of scientists do not yet fully understand, which can threaten life and livelihood, and has brought much of the world as we know it to a grinding halt. Well, we might feel vulnerable. It is for very good reason that pubs, clubs and restaurants and churches along with other places of worship are currently closed. It is not clever to be gung-ho, ignoring the best advice, citing the stiff British upper lip and saying, we survived the war. Viruses survive or even thrive on careless, bullish talk and the attitude that it won't get me. It might not, or at least might not affect you too seriously, but the person to whom it has passed on might not be as robust. Fearing no evil is not the same as saying there is no threat, that it is not real. Fearing no evil is trusting in God and taking good care. But it does mean that with care and generosity and a strong commitment to being community, we will emerge at the other end, different perhaps, but united and potentially even stronger. At the heart of our Christian faith is the conviction that God is a God who sticks with his people, who is not watching from afar, but somehow in the midst of it all, leading, guiding, inspiring, giving strength. And also at the heart of our faith is the belief that in Jesus Christ, God came among us in the deepest way imaginable, sharing our flesh and our frailty, and showing us through his own commitment and solidarity that in him God truly is our shepherd. It was in Bethlehem that I first encountered a whole community that had been in lockdown. The curfew imposed in the town had just been lifted for a short time in order that pupils might sit an important exam. 
People who had not been able to meet for days were talking in the streets as they rushed out to buy essential groceries. Children were out playing, reveling in the freedom that had been denied to them for what must have seemed like eternity, both to them and to their parents. Word had been given that the curfew was due to be imposed at 4pm that day. And we too became part of the rush as we hurried back to Jerusalem as the curfew fell and the tanks and armoured personnel carriers came rumbling back in. In the midst of all this activity, I saw a Bedouin shepherd making his way through the streets of Bethlehem, staff in hand, leading his sheep through the frantic activity. He looked as shepherds may well have looked back in the days of King David and Jesus, Jesus himself, serene and seemingly in no hurry at all. He was leading his sheep back where they might once again find green pastures and still waters. That image has stayed with me by way of startling contrast to the chaos and panic all around. People were doing necessary things. They weren't panic buying, as seems to have become our national hobby, but taking home only what they needed. People needed to catch up. Children needed to burn off some of their energy. And we needed to get back out to where we were staying and to safety. Yet, there was the shepherd taking his time, going at his pace, leading his flock to where they needed to be. He rather reminded me of the version of Psalm, Psalm 23 by the Japanese poet Toki Miyashina. The Lord is my pace setter, I shall not rush. He makes me stop and rest for quiet intervals. He provides me with images of stillness which restore my serenity. He leads me in ways of efficiency through calmness of mind, and his guidance is peace. Even though I have a great many things to accomplish this day, I will not fret, for his presence is here. His timelessness, his all-importance, will keep me in balance. He provide, prepares refreshment and renewal in the midst of my activity, anointing my head with the oil of tranquility. My cup of joyous energy overflows. Surely harmony and effectiveness shall be the fruits of my hours, for I shall walk in the place of my Lord and dwell in his house forever. Many of us do not cope well with enforced idleness. We want things, quick, things quickly, we want them now, and we want the freedom to go where we want and when we want. Although I have often joked in the past of my dream being snowed up, being snowed in for a week or two in order that I might catch up with so many things, desk work, reading, planning, contacting people, tidying my study, I'm not now sure that it's come to pass, albeit without the snow, I'm going to enjoy it. Beware sometimes of what you wish for. Our nation is slowing down, reluctantly, and perhaps to its surprise. The implications of all this will be serious and challenging for many people emotionally, educationally, financially, and in terms of their health. Isolation can and will be very tough indeed for some. And I would not wish in any way to underrate the challenges, sometimes life-changing challenges, for many people. Now is a time to keep our eyes and our ears and our hearts open to be engaged, thoughtful and generous. Tough though it will be, this need not be a wasted or futile time. Perhaps we do have to allow God to be, as the poem suggests, our pace setter. As a society, we do need to slow down, to reflect, to ponder, to pray, to make time to contact the people we always meant to contact, you know the feeling, another week has passed and I haven't been in touch with whoever. And the pile of unread books, well, it never seems to diminish. We tend to feed our souls on the soundbite or the quick Google search. 
perhaps COVID-19, for all that it is a very serious matter, will present us with new ways of thinking, new ways of living, new ways of being church and a community of people who truly care. Yesterday, somebody emailed me these words by Lynn Unger, which gave me food for thought. What if you thought of it as the Jews consider the Sabbath, the most sacred of times? Cease from travel, cease from buying and selling, give up just for now on trying to make the world different than it is. Sing, pray, touch only those to whom you commit your life, center down. And when your body has become still, reach out with your heart. Know that we are connected in ways that are terrifying and beautiful. You could hardly deny it now. Know that our lives are in one another's hands. Surely that has become clear. Do not reach out your hands. Reach out your heart. Reach out your words. Reach out all the tendrils of compassion that move invisibly where we cannot touch. Promise this world your love, for better or for worse, in sickness or in health, so long as we all shall live. This will be a tough time. For some it already is. But it need not be a futile or a fruitless one. At a time when so much else seems to have been taken out of our hands, we can still choose how we respond. To pick up the telephone, send a text or an email, to look out for the right neighbour you rarely see or notice, to read, to pray, to reflect, and perhaps to live that more deeply and serenely than a faster life normally permits. Amen. Let us pray. On this Mothering Sunday, we give thanks for homes where a mother's love has nurtured, soothed, encouraged and taught passing on to younger generations the wisdom of years, the family stories, the benefit of experience, and where in return her children and grandchildren have flourished and grown, have loved and cherished. We pray today for homes where a new life is being celebrated, where a newborn child is cradled softly in a mother's arms, and older siblings look on in astonished wonder or casual disappointment. And we pray for homes where each card and bouquet, each advert encouraging us to pamper our mothers feels like a personal blow, a reminder of the pain of loss, the jarring emptiness and the seeming aloneness. Loving God, like a mother hen protecting her brood, shelter and shield those who are vulnerable, we pray. Cosset and coddle those who are bruised and lead them to life in fullness. We remember too those whose memories are tinged with sadness or filled with anger, pain or resentment because they know only too well that mothers don't always follow the norm and homes are not always ideal. Where there is hurt or harm, abuse or neglect and the deep scars of ancient wounds, we pray for healing and wholeness. God our shepherd, may your rod and staff be their comfort and guide. In this time of change and challenge, as day by day the news is more drastic, the pandemic more severe, the steps we need to take more extreme, we pray for sense and discernment, 
that we may all take the right steps and behave in the appropriate ways, with unselfish motives and desire for the greatest good. We ask for patience and tolerance to cope with extended periods of isolation, and for courage that we may not be afraid in the face of uncertainty and what sometimes feel like overwhelming odds. Generous God, anoint us with the oil of gladness that we may appreciate the gifts we have and know how to use them well. We pray especially for those whose daily life is most directly affected by COVID-19 medical and nursing staff, pharmacists and carers, in hospital and community, those whose work is essential to keep the country heated, fed and safe, politicians and scientists seeking the well-being of the nation and with difficult decisions to take and implement. As we give them thanks for all that they do, we pray for your wisdom to guide them and that they will know your presence and your peace. We give thanks for those who through church or community groups, in food banks or neighbourhood networks, can harness the power of technology to make a difference, can reach out to those in greatest need and galvanise support from those who can still give. We bring before you, compassionate God, all who are ill. Those with long-term conditions made more concerning now, or with a new diagnosis and who face an anxious wait for treatment or surgery. Those whose mental well-being is fragile and under increased stress at this time. And all those at home or in hospital who have COVID-19 and long to see light at the end of the tunnel. Lead them, O oh God, to life-giving streams and to green pastures where they may rest and be restored to health. As we pray for all who mourn and whose farewells have had to be curtailed, we remember with thanksgiving that we are surrounded by the cloud of witnesses who testify to your goodness and remind us of your mercy and who encourage us to remain faithful as we journey through this life to life everlasting in and through Jesus Christ our Saviour who lives and reigns with you O God as creator Son and Spirit now and forevermore. Amen. May God, the Good Shepherd, lead you through green pastures and beside still waters. In the darkest of valleys, may you sense his presence before you and around you, and know that darkness and danger will not last forever. May you have enough to share, and know that you are richly blessed. May God's love and mercy pursue you all your days and your nights, and may you dwell in his presence forever. May peace be with you, and the blessing of God, Creator, Son, and Spirit, be with you and all whom you love, this day and forever. Amen. <laughs>